wrap up here uh, day one with a really exciting panel. Um, a lot of the platforms that you, you've gotten to meet, a lot of them out there in the, in the sponsor hall, uh, uh, the technology space is, is changing very quickly in community. Uh, having been in this space for 10 years, uh, it's been really interesting to see all the new platforms that are starting to come out and how uh, some of the bigger players are, are changing and evolving and reinvesting in community. Uh, it's, it's been a really interesting time. It's really exciting to see some of the bigger players putting a huge focus on, on smaller group programs and communities. And so this is actually the first time we've done a panel at CMX Summit in nine conferences. Um, and we thought this would be a really good format to hear from a few of the really big leaders that we've had uh, uh, building technology and starting to innovate in, in the community technology space. All right, so we have a, a few panelists. I'll introduce them one at a time, and then let's just, we'll say, we'll say you give a light clap while I introduce them, and we'll do our standing ovation at the end. Sound good? Yeah. Okay. All right, so first off, we have Mitali Patnik from uh, LinkedIn Groups. Uh, prior to LinkedIn, Mitali spent over a decade building consumer products at Microsoft, Yahoo, Google, and Twitter. She's a strong advocate for women in technology. Um, and she uh, also started LinkedIn's uh, Women in Product Initiative. So, welcome, Vitaly. Second up, we have Lindsay Russell. Uh, Lindsay's been working on the uh, Facebook Groups program. Uh, I I've had the opportunity to work with Lindsay quite a bit on the Facebook Group admin program and with the Facebook Groups team on how they're innovating on the Groups platform. Uh, it's been really exciting. She runs the Global Facebook Power Admins Program, which is this amazing program for admins all over the world running groups. They provide them with education, support. They use Facebook groups to, to bring them together. It's been an amazing program to be a part of and, and to see uh, and to work on with you. Um, and then finally, we have Dave Hirsch. <laughs> Dave is an entrepreneur, investor, advisor, based in San Francisco. He was the founding CEO of Jive. So, uh, Dave's been in this industry a really long time. Uh, founded Jive uh, 20 years ago? 2001, so almost 20 years ago. Uh, Jive has been obviously a huge player in the industry and one of the big tech leaders. Um, and he just recently announced that he acquired Mobilize, which is an amazing platform that's been growing in the space. Got some Mobilize fans out in the crowd. Um, and so they're doing some really innovative stuff. Uh, this is going to be kind of weird to do it, but let's do it anyway. Let's give a big standing ovation for him, All right. All right. That was, that was a good, very natural standing ovation for our panel. <laughs> how many is that total? How many, how many standing ovations is that? We're probably at like seven or eight. Five? Five. All right, well, we're still going strong. Um, cool, so uh, I would love to start off by just kind of getting a little bit of like a, a, a little bit of a status update. I think um, for your platforms, we, we've heard a lot. I know we've shared a lot of the updates and everything in the, in the CMX newsletter. Um, and so I kind of want to just quickly kind of give an update on, on how things are going with your platforms and, and how uh, basically the, the updates we've seen over the last year or so, how, how it's starting to look now. So maybe, Mitali, we could start with you. So LinkedIn Groups, um, is, uh, it's been a, a reinvestment recently yep. uh, for LinkedIn. It's been uh, a, a product that's been around for a long time. Yes. Um, it was deprioritized for some time, but has recently become a really big focus. And we've seen some updates coming out. So uh, how are things going? And, and what, what brought up this, this new focus on LinkedIn Groups? Yeah, so um, I don't know how many people here are familiar with LinkedIn groups, actually, just a show of hands. Okay. Nice. OK, so smattering of people are familiar with LinkedIn groups. So LinkedIn groups, um, that, that's actually evidence to um, the State of the Union. So LinkedIn groups um, has been uh, a core part of LinkedIn for pretty much since the beginning of the, of the company. Um, but um, as you said, um, it was because it was a standalone product and not really integrated in the, into the rest of LinkedIn, it was really hard for groups to keep up um, with their latest technology and innovations on the rest of the LinkedIn site. So things like 
notifications, uh, rich media posts, video, um, things that might seem obvious and have been available on the rest of LinkedIn were not available in groups. Um, so a big reason why we decided to reinvest and like, rebuild groups from the ground up last year is to really build it on top of the latest LinkedIn technology stack. And that's what we've done over the last year and just relaunched it a couple weeks ago. Um, and it's fully integrated back into the main LinkedIn website and uh, mobile apps uh, experience. So making it really easy to access your groups, to share content into your groups, to be able to find new groups to join, um, and all of that happening within the main core LinkedIn experience. So, so LinkedIn has a range of different ways that people interact yeah. on the platform. You now have the news feed, you have um, you know, obviously how people connect uh, just with each other, you have recruiting services. So, you know, Great to hear that the groups are becoming more integrated with a product. How is, uh, what's, what was the objective? Like, why did leadership decide that this is something that we now need to start putting more budget behind and really invest in? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So um, the way we think about um, the value that LinkedIn really provides is this is really like your professional community. And we think of um, groups as really being core to that professional community that you can have on LinkedIn. So groups are these trusted spaces where people with the same industry backgrounds uh, from the same company or the same alma mater can really come together. Um, with the same career aspirations, let's say, and just help each other, give and get help, share knowledge, share industry trends, and ultimately really advance their career, which is, at the end of the day, the core value proposition that LinkedIn offers its members. Um, so groups um, is a big part of how you can do that on LinkedIn, and that was the motivation behind uh, reinvesting in groups and like putting this effort. And it was a pretty massive um, effort just, you know, um, for the team here, I mean, it took our whole team a whole year to like really rebuild this product from ground up. Like we wrote the first line of code, it's a completely new group's product. So we have a wow. ways to go from here um, to like add. An, so the whole add, thing's like the whole rebuilt. thing's new. It's not yep. taking the old one, fixing it. Not at all. The old Redoing one's it. gone. <laughs> the wow. old groups is, is gone, and so a number of things like features that you may have been familiar with if you were uh, a group's admin, you may or may not see right away in the, in the new product and that's because it is a new product and we will be adding a lot of the features back over the mm -hmm. coming months. Is there a specific objective for the organization? Is it around engagement or, or something tied to the larger business objective? Yeah, and the way we think about it, it's not necessarily to move a particular metric like engagement, um, but we do think it's really important for our members to be part of quality groups. Um, where they are really having um, high quality conversations and getting value out of their community. And so that isn't necessarily a certain number of times per day or, or times per month in terms of a metric, but really to understand like, is this community valuable to them? And um, are they getting value back out of it? And how is that materializing in their own career um, and in how they're being able to advance their career? Like, get a new job, uh, you know, advance in their current job, uh, find, uh, if you're a freelancer, you know, find new uh, contract gigs, um, if that's what you're looking for. So these are the kinds of things that we hope like groups can really serve um, for our members, and that's how we measure success of the product. But it's really still like early days. Um, it's been exactly like two weeks. I think 9-14 was, uh, September 14th was when we launched the new product, so um, yeah. Yeah, well, congrats on getting that Thank out. You. I know how much your team was working on that. Um, big update. Um, so, Lindsay, on your end, Facebook's now been investing in Facebook groups, uh, kind of had this, like, big reinvestment. Groups were going, but not necessarily a priority for a long time, and then the last couple of years became a really big priority. And, and Mark Zuckerberg actually said that the, the entire mission was changed for Facebook to be focused on meaningful communities and... Um, groups has been a big part of that. I know, was it 100 million meaningful connections? Was that 200 it? 200 now. Was that? 200 now. 200 now. Yeah. Uh, and the goal is what? A billion. Oh, the goal is a billion. <laughs> My bad. You're like, a yes. million. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, and so uh, uh, we've seen a ton of new things come out for groups. Yeah. Obviously, a lot of people here are in the CMX Hub group and have seen some of those features themselves. Uh, how is that going? And, and yeah, what, what's the update on the, the mission towards building meaningful communities for Facebook? 
Cool, yeah. Hey guys, I'm Lindsay. I work in product marketing on the Facebook Groups team, like David said. Um, and Groups has been around for a while. It was first built in 2008, and it was always a little bit of a sleepier product. It was sort of there, people were using it, but it wasn't like the top priority um, from a company perspective. And that all really changed in the spring of 2017 when Mark wrote this letter, Building Global Community, really about um, kind of a manifesto on like the role that Facebook should have in the world and his perspective on um, why supportive communities are really important both in real life and also online and Facebook's role in that. And so as we started thinking about that, Groups is like an enormous product proof point for us in that. Um, and so a number of people started taking a really close look again at Groups. Um, and I happened to be on the team at that time and it was really an unbelievable experience. We were talking last night at dinner about, you know, we've all been in parts of those, uh, on teams or at companies during times when things are really just, people are really coming together and in flow and really motivated by a problem that, are, that they're trying to solve. And that was really our experience with groups on Facebook. And one of the first things we started orienting around was this notion of power admins, um, which are admins who are running kind of the biggest, the best, the most engaging and the most meaningful groups on Facebook. Um, and we realized that there was a lot more that we could do to help these people. So um, it's really been a journey over the last two years. David has been an incredible ally and teacher to us throughout that period. Um, certainly from a product perspective, you know, we're trying to build tools, build features that are going to make the lives of group admins easier and more efficient. And having worked across a number of product teams at Facebook, I can say fairly objectively that the product team has been nothing short of prolific in the amount of tools that they have built. Um, you know, when you think about things like group insights, group rules, group announcements, muting, scheduled posts, um, all sorts of features and policy changes that everything really built around feedback that we heard directly from admins. Um, so certainly that's what the product team is up to today and has been up to over the last few years. Um, from a marketing perspective, we have launched a number of programs that are designed to support admins in their, in their role as a group admin, and one of those is the Facebook Power Admins Group, which yeah. I run with Susie Nelson, who's right here in the front row. Hi, Susie. <laughs> Um, which um, are peer-to-peer -peer support groups that admins can join um, to be, uh, you know, help connect with other power admins and share advice and, and the experience of running really large active groups, which we all know can be quite difficult and draining at times. Um, and then our team is facilitating and moderating those groups. So we're um, releasing early product announcements into that space, we're driving conversation and dialogue, um, and then we're also providing a level of customer service and technical support to those members. Um, so those are some of the things that we've been up to. Happy yeah. to answer any questions um, yeah. now and after the session as well. Yeah, and uh, you can see a lot of uh, a lot of these folks are out there in, uh, in the vendor hall as well, so you can go say hi there, ask questions. Um, I'm curious, uh, real quick, on the meaningful community mm -hmm. component, because uh, we just heard Rich's talk about you know, the engagement trap and how like all activity isn't necessarily valuable to an organization. And Facebook also kind of realized this, that all activity does not mean that that activity is actually valuable or meaningful. Mm -hmm. And I know it's a very difficult and ongoing process of like really nailing down what does meaningful engagement uh, mean? What does that mean to have somebody be meaningfully engaged? Uh, so is there anything you could share about what, what that means to have somebody be meaningfully engaged and how do you measure that? Yeah, and I'll take a step back and just frame what that is generally because this is a really, really important point. It's kind of our North Star from a product perspective, which is it's not just about getting a bunch of people to join a bunch of random groups. It's um, the thing that we're very oriented around is we want people to be part of groups that are deeply meaningful to them. And so what that means is, you know, it's people oftentimes will say, like, this is an oasis online for me. Like, these groups are a lifeline. Um, they are like a, a massive source of support in their online experience and often in their offline experience as well. Um, so it's, and that's why we have this metric of meaningful groups and people who are meaningfully connected to a group. Um, and so we, when, by our count, we have 200 million of those today. And Mark has said that within four or five years, we want that number to be a billion people who are meaningfully connected to a group. Um, and ideally, we'd like everyone beyond a billion people to be meaningfully connected to a group because we do see it to be so rewarding and meaningful to the people who are in it. You know, there's so many amazing stories that come out. Having done this work with group admins over the last few years, it's an honor to just hear their stories and get to know them a little bit. But 
tons of amazing testimonials from you know groups for for health um, people around health and wellness issues to local groups to women's groups and then also a lot of fun hobby groups and and things like that as well. So um, yeah, in terms of exactly how we measure it, we are asking effectively a sense of community type. We're pulling people for um, to self-report a sense of community, okay. and then we're also looking at things like time spent, how many friends do you have in your group, and a number of other dimensions as well. Okay, so kind of a combination of quantitative and qualitative mm -hmm. feedback. Um, and, and, and to what extent is Facebook groups uh, investing in and focusing on working with organizations? Obviously, a lot of people here uh, working with a business or nonprofit, different mm -hmm. kinds of groups. Um, Facebook groups are for kind of the whole gambit of different kinds of communities. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there are a lot of businesses now using it. Um, so what, is that going to be a big focus for Facebook going forward? Um, we don't have, not, not like insofar as a audience strategy or segment strategy, but we certainly have shipped a number of products that are designed to have pages and groups um, play together better. So oftentimes if you are a brand or an, a cause or an organization, you might have a page, but you may or may not necessarily have a group. Um, but there's a ton of features that we've created for, pe for brands and pages that might want to participate in a group type of dialogue. So pages can create groups. We're testing a new feature where pages can actually join groups as a member. They don't necessarily need to admin the group. Um, there's lots of features around bulk inviting people if you have like a CSV file, a bulk pre-approving people. Um, and then there's a, you know, there's new features around um, expanded group insights around dropping a pixel so that if you have a website that your group is linked to, you can start to kind of understand the traffic between that group and your website. So it's not a like a specific area of focus, but it's definitely something that there's teams that are working on. And there's a genuine and sincere invitation for feedback around that. You guys can grab me, you can grab Susie, you can join the Power Admins group and give us feedback there. But we'd be we'd love to learn more about your use cases and, and build for it. Yeah, awesome. And Dave, you started Jive. You got out of the community industry, and now you've decided to come back. <laughs> uh, so the last company I did was a jewelry company. Jewelry. Yeah, and so I went to a, uh, a conference in Vegas maybe, I don't know, six months ago. Yeah. That was scary enough to get me back to the community industry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you guys are my people. You guys are awesome. Cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Standing O. No offense um, to anyone building jewelry communities. Yeah. <laughs> I, they're great, love them too, but not my people. These, these are my people, yeah. So it's great to be back. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, you, you know, I, I've loved getting to catch up with you recently and hear kind of your background and community. You've, you, you helped grow this space from a very early stage. Um, built one of the big platforms. Uh, what, what made you decide to, to jump back in, and, and uh, why mobilize? What excited you about that platform? Yeah, so uh, that was uh, 2010 that I stepped down from job. They basically, you know, we decided to make the, the take the company public, and at that point, I opted to uh, to save my marriage <laughs> and uh, <laughs> got out of the business. At that point, it was a you know it was a wonderful, wonderful ride. In fact, on the way over here this morning, literally a block between my hotel and here. I ran into uh, an ex-Jive employee. It was like, oh my God, it's going yeah, to see Jive has a big and presence in Portland. She was like, we're having an ex-Jiver happy hour tonight. Like, you have to come. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that mode, like, you know, they still get together all the time. And, and, you know, what Lindsay was talking about, when you're in that point where there's magic that happens, when there's something really incredible where it's just kinetic uh, and everybody loves being part of that, we had that for a while. Uh, you know, and I left and, and the company went public. And I think the, the shift turned from... Uh, you know, a focus on customers and innovation to a focus on quarterly numbers and sales and, and you know, that happens with companies a lot of times, an unfortunate, you know, situation. And so I, I kind of watched what happened to Jive as it, you know, uh, ended its life, as it were, you know, and yeah. at least the life that I had started for it and what, what I knew. Uh, and so there was certainly something cathartic about coming back to the community space because I love it so much. Uh, the people are really wonderful. Uh, and uh, and when I, I had known Mobilize a long time and had uh, advised uh, Sharon, the founder, early on, and I think there was something that they represented for me uh, about you know, the, the evolution of the category, which is that when we did Jive, Jive was more of a platform, right? On any given day, we'd be talking to somebody who was a support community or a CIO or internal knowledge management network, right? It was a platform for doing all kinds of community and collaboration. And at the time, you could do that. You know, fast forward to now, there's 40 times as many software companies as there were back then. Uh, and if you are not solving specific pain points in the world, I, I don't think you survive. You know, every occasionally maybe you get a Slack or somebody who can do something pretty magical like that. But in general, 
I think you really have to be an aspirin, not a vitamin. Uh, and what Mobilize did was they created a solution for membership-driven communities. Uh, so it was all about engaging membership and having a beautiful interface that people love, and it was frictionless. And it was just a modern approach to uh, these organizations that were having a hard time connecting with uh, their membership uh, because... When you say membership, what do you mean specifically? So, you know, think about like uh, when it's a membership-driven community, so it's uh, associations and nonprofits or corporate professional networks where, you know, like a HubSpot who's trying to get, you know, member, like people who are in that profession to come together and they get to know each other, mentor each other, share best practices. Right. So not support communities, not like developer networks. You know, those are things that I'm saying, those are better served by other organizations. Let's focus on the one thing we could be best in the world at. Uh, and that's engaging a, a membership around a cause. Uh, and honestly, you know, what is more fun than that, you know, uh, to, to work on? So I'm, I'm thrilled uh, to be back. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, we'll, we'll dig in more into that, but the idea of the specialization in the community space is really interesting. And we're seeing some platforms that are kind of being able to do it all. And like Facebook has a pretty widespread of different kinds of communities. Uh, LinkedIn's definitely starting to focus on, you know, the professional side. You have a membership organization and there are platforms like, you know, Influitive that are specifically focused on ambassador programs or user voice specifically focused on innovation. And that specialization seems to be something that, that's happening more and more. Um, we'd love to just hear real quick, uh, what, what are the biggest challenges that you're seeing your, the community organizers on your platforms having? Like, what's the biggest thing that, that they get stuck on or they run into right now? And, and how are you helping them get through those things? You want to start? Sorry, do you want me to start? I guess that's you. I'm not gonna, <laughs> not gonna point at myself anymore. Um, uh, yeah, I can, I, can, I can start. I mean, I think part of um, uh, how we went about this uh, rebuilding process was really in partnership with our existing community organizers, so our um, admins that were um, um, already have had groups on LinkedIn were a huge source of feedback um, for us. Uh, mostly like tough love, negative feedback, but <laughs> feedback is a gift, so we take all feedback, so please, please send feedback to us. Um, but yeah, it was really in partnership with them and like really understanding their pain points that we were able to prioritize what we would even uh, go about building in the first place and what we are building um, over the next uh, many months. Um, so some of the biggest um, challenges um, on LinkedIn um, have been, uh, like I'll be completely honest, it's just been really hard to engage members, right? So when you have a completely standalone product that isn't part of your main, um, and, and like Lindsay can speak to this, that isn't part of the main like uh, LinkedIn apps and main LinkedIn website, it's really hard to make sure that your uh, group members are going back on a regular basis and to be able to get them back and, and, and engage. And that's been a challenge across the board um, for all kinds of groups. So, um, and that continues to be like one of the primary challenges and we wanna make sure that we really solve for that. Um, along with that are things like, you know, how can we empower admins to build better tools to, to target the message uh, correctly? So I really liked um, Rich's talk um, yeah. before, um, which was really interesting about, you know, lurkers slash learners, and you don't necessarily need to make sure that every single person is, uh, you know, suddenly becoming like a, a regular and contributing to the platform and, yeah. and, and, and generating posts and discussions. Um, a lot of people will just come and consume content and get value out of your group, and that's fine. And so how do we make sure that admins have really the analytics and understand, you know, who amongst their groups is the lurker slash learner versus who are the regulars and who are kind of like the evangelists and yeah. be able to target messages correctly and be and show give them those kinds of insights. And that's the kind of tools that we need to build for our admins. Um, and we hear that loud and clear from them. It's a it's a big request. So you're building them? Yes, we will build a lot of a lot promise? of feedbacks. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> a lot of the feedback that you've all sent us, that you continue to send us. Like I promise you we are working on it. It is really, really hard to build products for hundreds of millions of members yeah. um, uh, at that kind of scale. So it's not as easy as it sounds to like turn around and build a feature and like get it out there. But it's coming. Yeah. Lindsay, do you know anything about building <laughs> platforms for hundreds of millions of members? Um, yeah. I mean, building for a billion, I would say, is our, our overall challenge and yeah. opportunity right now from a product team's perspective. But if your question was about what are the challenges that we've heard from folks who are doing community yeah. leadership on our platform. The thing I hear over and over again is no matter the group type or where people are located or what their group is about, they're looking to grow their communities, engage their members, and keep their communities safe. 
Um, so those are, that, th those are three very clear vectors for us to build products against. Um, the team has built a lot and will continue to build more and it's always a question of, of, of trade-offs and there's always more to build than yeah. there is time. Um, but the team will continue to, to invest in that way. From a marketing perspective, we just want to get these stories out there more. Like the stories are so, so inspirational. It, it's really moving and so, um, you know, it's like we work with admins and we're so immersed in admin culture. Like we, we have, we just, you know, I think about someone like Naka Allgood who's running a group called Mama Dragons, which is for mothers of the Mormon faith who have a child who comes out as gay or bi or trans. And this provokes a crisis of faith in them that's that, and, and that is really, really the most difficult thing for them to have to reconcile. Um, and they find this group is really about providing, it's a sacred space for dialogue around that for women who are going through that. Um, and I mean, it's a lifeline for these people. And they're so, I mean, the, 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 these, like a group in that scenario is absolutely essential. Um, I'm curious to hear specifically on mm -hmm. the safety focus, right? Yep. Cause it's definitely, um, Facebook being such a big platform and, and there are uh, ongoing issues that come up with privacy and, and data and harassment on, on a lot of these large social mm -hmm. platforms. So how are you helping admins keep their communities safe on your platform? Yeah, integrity is a big um, area of investment for us and it's not an area that I work on personally but I can assure you that there's lots of teams that do. Um, and my knowledge of the area is that there's sort of three um, kind of points that we can feel like we can address some of these issues on the platform. One is we specific to groups. One is we can definitely give tools to admins to moderate those types of um, conversations and things that come up inside of groups. We can give more tools to members to let admins know when things are happening. And then we, as a platform, have a duty and a responsibility to do a lot of um, proactive detection and enforcement. So that's... Um, there's lots of teams that are very, very actively working on it. And I can assure you that we get it and we take that responsibility really seriously. Yeah, awesome. Dave, can you share anything that you're seeing with the organizations using your platform? What, what's the biggest challenge that they're having when they're building community? I mean, I, you know, number one with a bullet is engagement. Uh, you know, they, they, their whole, you know, raison d'etre as an organization is to engage members, you know, and this is an era when people get you know, 130 emails a day, 130 text messages a day, they see 5,000 ads a day, they're on Slack, they're on WhatsApp, and they're sending them newsletters. I mean, how many people read the newsletters they get? <laughs> like a couple, okay. Well, besides the CMX one, yeah, yeah. Um, but like, you know, I must get 130 newsletters a day, right? And, yeah. and it's just hard, right? And so a lot of it has to come down to personalization. How can you actually, you know, create an environment where they're seeing what they need at the time they need it, and there's, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, done in such a way to, to draw them in uh, and pull them in uh, in a way that creates value. Uh, so at the end of every, you know, interaction that people have, they, they say thank you. I'm so glad this exists, right? How do you get to that point? How do you get the sense of belonging and, and a place where people feel seen and heard uh, and valued? Uh, and so I think that's really the hardest part. You know, it's just a very different era. And even though when we created Jive and, you know, we're, we're a static portal, you know, uh, that people had to figure out how to navigate could work back then because they didn't have much else. It just doesn't work anymore. Uh, and so I think they're all struggling with that and struggling with trying to figure out how do I use listservs and email to, to do this. And, um, and so that's uh, what I saw the most potential to, to impact uh, was, you know, shaping uh, not only a product but, but a philosophy of, of uh, what I call outcomes as a service. Um, so humans and technology just helping organizations uh, get to the level of engagement they, they deserve, uh, yeah. you know, for their cause and for their purpose with their, their constituents. How, how do you look at the, the value for your, your customers? Because you've, you've been in this space for a long time. You've obviously had to sell expensive software over, over your career. Um, how do you, like, when you're, when you're faced with, like, how do I communicate the value of community to an organization, and how do you help your, your community builders, your clients, communicate the value or figure out the value uh, how do you navigate that? Yeah, well, I've been at the company five weeks now, so I can say definitively, <laughs> I know how to do this really well. Um, I, no, I, I do think that, uh, you know, it does come down to finding uh, metrics that are, uh, you know, somewhat customized for that particular client and what they're trying to do. So if you can get them at the outset to say this is what success looks like and try and find 
you know, to use the data that's available to, to find metrics that are in support of those. I mean, my goal is to give, you know, the customers a set of three visualizations for board slides that would make the board members do the, you know, standing ovation that these guys are doing before. <laughs> like, that would be the goal. Uh, as to exactly what that is, I don't know yet. It's pretty early for me, but it's one of the things that I'm focused a lot on right now. All right, well, I mean, to push on it a little bit, like, uh, a lot of your focus now is to acquire companies that have a good, you know, usually it's a good brand or a good foundation and figure out how to make them profitable. So where, where do you see community fitting into profitability? Or like, are, are the organizations that you've acquired have good community but didn't figure out how to make it sustainable and profitable? Is there anything that you've learned that can really help? Yeah, and again, all these organizations are different, right? But if you take an association, for example, like they're looking at, you know, growing their membership, well, their membership pays dues, right? Uh, when those members leave and they go to another organization, do they actually stay with the association? And then they're increasing their overall footprint. What about sponsorship rates? Are those improving? What about, you know, event participation uh, and things like that? So, you know, for associations, they may look at it one way versus a nonprofit, which is actually looking at, you know, overall, uh, you know, grant sizes they get as a member, you know, uh, and donations that come from these groups, again, sponsorships, uh, overall impact and brand loyalty and recognition, things like that. So I do think it looks different in different organizations, but I think if you actually spend the time, and this is the part that is important to me, you know, a lot of the, the software companies, they are owned by investors. Investors look for a certain set of financial characteristics for the company, and that prevents them from doing things like adding services, because it, that messes with their gross margin, right? Uh, and so if a company becomes too financial driven, the aforementioned company we talked about included, uh, then I think it loses the outcomes that it's trying to get for its customers a lot of times because that's anathema to the financial characteristics they're trying to put together. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. In other words, like if you actually put humans at this, you can figure out good answers to questions like what does success look like for a nonprofit or for an association or for a corporate uh, community of students in university or whatever it is. They all look different, but I think if you spend the time uh, you know, and Rich did a great job of this in the last presentation. You can kind of figure out ways to, to tell uh, a really great story using the data to support it. Uh, maybe it's not perfect, but I think you can do a right. good job. Right. Yeah, I love that idea. And Lindsay, you also share kind of like sharing the stories seems to be a really important thing. Like, how do you bring out, how can technology help bring out the stories in your communities um, and, and using that to get more buy-in and using that to, to show the narrative that you want? Um, I'm curious, uh, in, our, in our final few minutes here, um, looking forward, uh, what should we expect in the community technology space? We see groups becoming a huge focus, so we're moving away from these large, I mean, not moving away, but the large social networks, you seem to be reinvesting into more closed, more admin-run groups, more distributed communities. We see things like messaging apps and messaging groups, things like Telegram and Slack and even WhatsApp all like continuing to, to really grow. What are you seeing as people who are plugged into this tech industry uh, every day? What, what does the future look like for this space? Lindsay, do you want to start this time? <laughs> um, I mean, for us, it's really about continuing to, to to grow and behind that incredible mission statement which Mark set for us. And you were there at the Facebook Community Summit in 2017 when we changed the mission statement and um, that, that's really been an energizing force for not just the group's team but across Facebook as a company and even across our family of apps. Um, you know, what does community look like? Not just for groups but for other products that are out there. Um, if that's our company mission statement, we all need to be thinking hard about that. I think groups um, has done a lot of, has been really immersed in, in that, you know, both from a research perspective, from a user testimonial and user voice perspective over the last two years. Um, and so now we're doing some of that, the sharing of those insights internally. Um, and then certainly from, from a group's perspective, like I said, we're, we have a very kind of big, hairy, audacious goal, which is to get a billion people meaningfully connected to a group um, in the next four to five years. Cool. So lots more to come. And to do that, we want to make sure that there's a lot of meaningful groups for people to join, and then we also want to do a better job of helping people discover groups that could potentially be meaningful to them. So there's a lot of work for us to do so you're, across you're gonna be, those two. So you're going to be working on helping like groups on the platform be more easily discoverable throughout the network? I mean, that's something that we, we would always be interested in. You know, We definitely want to make um, it easy for people to discover groups that they would love being a member of. Um, so that's, that's certainly an, an area that that, uh, that we should and will work on. Yeah. Dolly? 
Yeah, I can speak to, I mean, definitely for um, LinkedIn from a group's perspective, um, because we just recently launched, um, we're going to spend the next few quarters, you know, definitely the next year really investing in a lot of the tools that empower admins and community builders on our platform, like with all of the feedback from um, that we have been receiving, but also like keep getting from our from our admins. Um, so LinkedIn's mission, um, like I said at the outset, is really connecting professionals in the world to make them more productive and successful and groups like fits right into this. One of the core things that, um, that LinkedIn has uh, really to offer to any community um, and definitely within the group's product is um, the, the data that we have around professionals. Um, so if you are in, in an alumni group, for example, um, like I am from a business school, you can search within that alumni group now for, you know, who do I know who works at Facebook um, or who do I know who is a CXO in this industry, right? Because we have a lot of that rich data set yeah. available and be able to connect with, um, with those members. And I think that's the kind of investment that we would like to uh, continue to make to to really enable all of our members on LinkedIn to use groups as a platform where they can connect with other professionals um, in their industry from their uh, colleges, et cetera, right. and, like advanced. Are LinkedIn groups a platform that businesses should be looking at using for their customers or for their own community programs? Yeah. Or why, def- why should they be? Yeah, definitely. So we already see a lot of uh, businesses, companies um, that have LinkedIn uh, groups, and uh, this is something that uh, you know, we invite all companies to definitely think about creating LinkedIn groups. So there's different kinds of uh, groups that we've seen succeed from a company perspective. Um, there are groups that are, uh, for example, uh, just a company su- uh, support groups, uh, support networks. Um, but there are also groups where a company just wants to establish thought leadership in a certain area or, you know, sort of be associated with a certain type of community. So Oracle has an incredible CIO a group, for example, fully vetted. They know that these are CIOs. Um, they don't necessarily have to be Oracle customers, but they want to show thought leadership in the you know, IT industry. And so they created this group that they, that they manage. So we see these kinds of groups already on LinkedIn. And um, again, because we have the availability of the, the data set that they can then use to target the right kind of members into the group and grow those communities, it's really valuable for, for companies, yeah. for sure. It sounds like an advantage of both LinkedIn and Facebook building on the platform is that distribution exactly and you'll both be investing in, in that um, cool last words Dave on, on what do you see as the, the future of the space or where does it where do you see the tech industry and the community industry need to go I, I do get a sentiment a lot that like people get frustrated with the platforms and not access to enough data not not access to the right tools sometimes people say that platforms are building for you know the executive team not for the community professional uh, where do you think this, this space needs to go for it to, to serve the industry in the best way? Yeah, uh, I'm going to go off script and get a little philosophical on this yeah. one and say that, you know, Homo sapiens as a species has been around for 200 <laughs> It's real philosophical. Years, right? <laughs> uh, and think about it, like the, the ones that propagated the species were the ones that were the most tribal oriented. In other words, probably the most neurotic, right? The ones that really needed to belong. Those are the ones that had babies. And so we're like 200,000 years with a product of that which means that we have this fierce desire to belong, right? And yet, technology has kind of done this job of separating us you know, into our homes, our cars, and our devices. And, and uh, I would say if there's anything that I would hope for, it's to not start with tech as the solution, it's to not start with the platform as the solution, but to start with the human, it's to start with the narrative and the story, which is what humans are about. And if we can do that, what Lindsay was talking about, to share these stories and use this as a means to get real human interactions to happen and actually create a sense of belonging and purpose together, to me, that's where it needs to go. And that's what's been missing. Mm. All right. Well, I think that's a good, uh, good as any note to end on. So thanks again to our panel. Please give a huge, see you next time. Thank you to them.